Thank you, ladies, for that. Amen. What a blessing. Hey, let me invite you back to our evening services. Uh, you've already heard me mention, but I just want you to understand some of the things that goes on here. We have those nine other services going on, upward to 90 workers that is in those services working. And so when you come back on Sunday night, if you only have opportunity to attend on Sunday morning, you miss uh, close to 100 different people that would be here in the evening service that you don't presently see even now as we speak. And so let me encourage you to come back and receive a warm welcome from them. We do thank you for those that are visiting this morning. What an honor uh, it is to be able to have you in our services, and thank you so much for that. In the Bible, the Bible says in Psalm 133 and verse 1, the Bible says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, the Bible speaks a lot about the unity of brethren. Now, who are the brethren? The brethren are those people that are saved, those people that name the name of Christ, those that come together, if you will please, for the purpose, I believe, uh, the express purpose of being able to share the gospel with others. Well, a brother, what is a brother? Well, a brother, somebody's received Christ as Savior. And so the Bible says that there's common ground for brothers and sisters, if you will, please, to be able to come together and to fellowship together. There's nothing like Christians fellowshipping together. I mean, some fellowship over hunting and some fellowship over fishing and some fellowship over uh, uh, ladies uh, maybe shopping for certain items or whatever or maybe some type of social program. I know yesterday we had our uh, nursery appreciation luncheon to be able to honor all those that have served in the nursery so very faithfully. Then yesterday, of course, our, our Baptist uh, Scout Rangers went out and uh, they, it's, it's what we have have done to it's a club that we have here uh, that is uh, sort of like the Boy Scouts or the Cub Scouts but yet Christian driven and Brother Hamager and his workers have done a fabulous job and yesterday they took a trip together and, and uh, being able to spend time together and so many things from uh, the times that uh, the girls volleyball teams play and we appreciate all the coaches and assistant coaches there and the basketball and the little league this and the little league that that we have and so it's just been really neat to be able to see people come together and fellowship together, whether it's singing in a choir, whether it's working a bus route, whether it's going soul winning, whether it's having a, a fellowship, or whether it's going on a retreat that we have or something of that caliber, fellowshipping together with believers is really a wonderful thing to be able to do. And so the Bible talks here about how good and how pleasant it is uh, for the brethren uh, to be able to dwell together in fellowship or in unity, if you will, please. And so as we come together in unity and as we come together to be able to encourage each other and help each other and to strengthen each other. Can I tell you, there is strength in numbers. Uh, now, we do have problems in our nation. Uh, we understand that uh, we ought to be united as we do stand, and, and, uh, and we understand that united we stand and divided we do fall. We've seen other nations fall. We've seen other uh, things that's taken place in nations around the world when all of a sudden the nation begins to divide, and then there's civil wars that take place in particular nations and things of that nature. Uh, even in our country, the great civil war that took place where brother was put against brother, and there was great, great uh, lives that were lost during that time of a civil war. But can I speak to you this morning on how we ought not to be divided? There is divisions that we do see. There is the dividing of nations, the dividing of nations. Now, the Bible says in Luke chapter 11, verse 17, the Bible says every kingdom divided against itself is brought, it says, to des desolation. The Bible says here, and a house divided against a house it says, falleth. And so uh, in our nation, we ought to decide that we are not going to be divided. Now, there is things that uh, does divide us when it comes to uh, being a principle-driven, Christian-driven nation. Now, let me share with you, our nation was founded as a Christian 
nation. Uh, let's never forget that. Now, because of that, uh, the unity of the brethren is what I'm talking about. How you and I, as brothers and sisters in Christ, can certainly be able to stand for the right things that are right within our nation and within our grips, if you will, and be able to train others to be able to do the same thing, uh, to be able to train others to have a great appreciation for the freedom that God has given us. You know, I preach in many nations around the world. I just arrived back from India uh, just about uh, three weeks ago, and Brother Padawathiko and I and Brother Tomley and uh, Brother Denton Bell uh, took that trip, and we held a pastor's conference in India. And can I tell you, uh, being in India and then being in America, uh, if I had a choice, now I'm going to be a little bit biased here, I would always choose America. Uh, it's just certain things about America that just stands out when it comes to the liberties that we have. Uh, comes to the freedoms that we have, uh, comes to that which is uh, uh, the boldness that we are able to have the liberty to preach the Bible and to be able to go out and help people come to know Christ as their personal Savior. But can I tell you, when a nation becomes divided, it's like a house standing against the house, and it ought never to be. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 28, it says, remove not the ancient landmark, it says, which thy fathers have set. You know, and uh, I noticed this in Cambodia as I used to preach in Cambodia every year. And as I learned about what took place as uh, communism began to take over. And, and then all of a sudden they uh, asked, of course, uh, for all the firearms completely to be turned in. And, and uh, I studied the history on that and how they would bring all their firearms and put them in the center of the city. And, uh, and they were confiscated and then they were destroyed. And then they took the people that were educated people and they marched them down into the middle of the city and they shot them and things of that nature and I watched all uh, the history of that that took place there as they turned of course the public schools into prison camps and stuff and I think oh how horrible that is but then I saw as the people rose up and as the people decided that hey here's what we're going to do we're not going to stand for something like that we still want our liberty. And today, if you were to go to that country, there is great liberty uh, because uh, there was a people that became united. Now, may I say this? The Bible does teach about how we're not supposed to remove the ancient landmarks which our fathers have set uh, before us. Uh, as we talk about uh, our nation, think about the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, it says, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I hope we always keep that. I hope that I remember when I was coming up as a public tool young person, uh, we'd always stand up in the morning times, we'd salute the flag, we'd say uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. I remember after I got saved, uh, well, very unique, but after I got saved, I, I talked to a fellow by the name of Boone. Uh, Boone was my social studies teacher, and I remember talking to him and, and him saying, you know, it'd be really neat, it'd be really neat if we had uh, somebody that would be interested in having a Bible club, and, and you told me what you did, and you got saved, and he said, it'd be really neat if somebody did that. I'm talking to you, Mike, he said. It'd be really neat if somebody did that. Mike, pay attention, I'm talking to you. It'd be really neat if somebody would just do that. And I said to Mr. Boone, I said, you're mentioning my name over and over again. He said, oh, great, you got it. So you're volunteering, aren't you? You know, and I remember, of course, uh, uh, starting that Bible club in the public school and Mr. Boone being my sponsor. And uh, I remember that. And I remember the countless of young people that would come and the countless of young people in my public school that bowed their heart and they received Jesus Christ as Savior. Uh, not because there was a fellow by the name of Mike Wells that started a Bible club, but because the Word of God does change lives. When a person receives Jesus Christ as Savior, God will change their life. Uh, can I tell you, the day that I got saved, I always remember that day, the day that I received Jesus Christ as Savior. Boy, I remember how God moved in and God changed my life. Can I tell you, can I testify that uh, uh, when my daddy received Christ as Savior, can I tell you how God moved in and how God changed my dear daddy's life? Can I tell you, can I testify how my older brother, how he received 
received Christ as Savior through uh, uh, his son and other people witnessing the hymn and how God moved in and God changed Dave's life. Can I tell you that God does the same thing in a nation? Uh, God will take the word of God and God will bless it. You say, oh, preacher, you think that everybody ought to be saved? Oh, yes, I do. The Bible said God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, I believe that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that's anybody uh, that calls upon the name of Christ that understands the clarity of the gospel and understands their need of receiving Christ and Christ only is their Savior. Yes, that person truly can be born again. That person truly can be saved. And I thank God that we have a place right here that's called the United States of America where we can take the Bible and preach the Bible and teach the Bible and show people their need of receiving Jesus Christ as Savior. Well, I'm so thankful for that. And I hope that we'll never become a nation that is so divided that it takes away the privileges of Christians that are living in this great society in which we serve uh, to be able to give that which is the gospel to people that need Christ as Savior. I'm saying when a nation becomes divided, when a nation all of a sudden takes on that which is uh, a different course than what God would have them to take on when all of a sudden they become a nation without God they come to ruin we understand that as we study the Babylonian Empire and why it did fall we understand that as we study the Egyptian Empire and why it did fall we understand that when it comes to the Grecian Empire and why why it did fall and of course the Roman Empire and etc etc oh doesn't the Bible say blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord you know, as long as we have God as our Father, if you will, as the one that saved us and the one that truly can unify us. I mean, I can tell you this. Uh, I can tell you that when two Christian brothers sit down, there is good fellowship. Uh, some people can fellowship over this, that, and the other. But when two Christian brothers sit down and uh, they can have fellowship and God be the one that is the uh, direction of their fellowship, it will change their outcome of their entire conversation. Matter of fact, it would change the content of their entire conversation. I'm saying this. I'm saying that uh, as the Bible teaches here, that uh, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. United we stand and divided we fall. And our nations, uh, of course, uh, you see that all throughout the lands of the world. But then you see divided churches. I'm talking about divided on the inside. Oh my, you get to see churches that uh, uh, have problems and churches uh, that have difficulties. And boy, I thank God that we don't have that here at Parkside Baptist Church. I thank God that it's a friendly church. And I thank God that it's a church that has a good spirit. Spirit. And boy, thank God that it's a church that shows the love of Christ as you reach out to people and try to help them and encourage them to be able to obey the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12, the Bible says, Now this I say that every one of you uh, saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. The Bible says in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Is Christ divided? Uh, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? All right, uh, I said that there's a philosophy that's going around the metro that I don't care for at all. Because there are churches, I'm talking about churches now, that baptize, and they baptize in deep water just like we do, uh, but they baptize in the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Pastor. Now, can I tell you that ought not to be? No, the Bible teaches we're supposed to baptize in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Ghost. That's the way that is scriptural believers' baptism. But now understand this. Understand that churches, yes, even churches, not just being divided, if you will please, from other churches, but the main concern of local churches is being divided within. You know, uh, it used to be that uh, those that uh, were fundamental independent Baptists uh, got a name, and they were called the fighting fundamentalists. Now, it wasn't because they fought sin. Oh, no. No, no. No, it's because they fought each other. 
Yeah, and, uh, and can I tell you, listen, uh, I, I believe if a church that's a, a fundamental independent Baptist church is, is doing their best and running buses and going soul winning and reaching the lost and supporting missionaries, okay, uh, then uh, give, give grace to maybe some differences. Maybe they use a, a blue colored hymn book and maybe they don't use a burgundy color. Oh, maybe they have a different color pew. Oh, yes. I've heard of churches that uh, have splits over the color of the pews. Uh, I've heard of churches that have splits over the color of the carpet. Oh, my, those things are so incidental and unimportant. Can I tell you, no matter what the carpet is and its color, you still got to walk on it. Amen. And no matter what the color of the pews is, oh, don't you thank God you got one to sit in? Well, sure. Now, I'm saying this. I'm saying that uh, churches sometimes become divided, and they become divided within themselves. Oh, I'm not going to sit with brother so-and-so because brother so-and-so, I don't like his deodorant. Uh, I'm not going to sit beside sister so-and-so because I don't like her uh, choice of perfume. Uh, I'm not going to take in fellowship with so-and-so because I don't like their demeanor. I don't like their attitude or their disposition. And you have members in churches across America that are backstabbing, uh, backstabbing each other and, uh, and uh, hurting each other and trying to cut each other's throat. By the way, can I help you out a little bit? Ever you come across uh, one of those creatures that try to do such, then uh, just uh, shake their hand and say, God bless you and have a good day. Uh, uh, don't don't let somebody ruin your day in serving Jesus Christ. Uh, I think you ought to come to church excited about the Word of God. Now, it used to be, I know it's for sure, but it used to be people would come to church, boy, they'd show up excited about the preaching, and they'd come oh, just longing for God to do something. Would it be that we could have those days again where people have a longing to hear the Word of God, where people have a longing to hear the preaching of the Bible, where people would have a longing to be able to fellowship with each other inside of the confines of that which is the local church? Yes, it could be. How does it start, preacher? It starts with me. It starts with you. That's how it starts. Uh, we decide that we're going to be the ones that uh, extend that good hand of blessing. We're going to be the ones that's going to extend that good hand uh, to be able to say, you're welcome and I care about you and I, I want to be able to have fellowship with you. Now, by the way, when a church changes their doctrine, doctrine, now that is different. You know, it used to be many years ago, when I was coming up, I've been preaching now for 34 years, and it used to be many years ago when I was coming up, back in the late 70s, uh, it used to be that I would hear about the old-fashioned, that they did call them that, old-fashioned Methodist churches that would preach the gospel of Christ clear and plain. There'd be no works in it. It would be clear and plain. There used to be a day when uh, those that were of uh, uh, perhaps the Lutherans or the Presbyterians and whatnot, boy, they'd preach it straight. And all of a sudden, something changed. I don't know what. But now, even some Baptist churches, I tell you, don't even preach the gospel of Christ clear and plain. May I say that uh, we ought to make sure that as we train individual soul winners that we do our job and making sure the gospel is very clear. Amen. You know, you, you don't want to be the cause of a little child right. not understanding the clarity of the gospel. Amen. You don't want to make that child, if you would please, a twofold child of hell. You want to make sure that they understand. We tell our soul winners, please take time. Take time with children. You know, because uh, these children, as you take the gospel, they listen to you very clearly. And uh, make sure that you give it. Uh, treat them just like you'd want somebody else to treat your own child. Make sure it's clear. Take your time. You know there's no rush. We have all eternity, don't we? On earth, most of us will live a little bit longer than even we might even anticipate. You know, men are now living to be uh, 70 and 75 and 80 and Women are now living to be 80 and 85 and 90 and still in good health. Brother Mac went with the soul winning yesterday, and I watch Brother Mac. I admire Brother Mac. 85, Brother Mac. Out soul winning with our soul winning men's team yesterday, one of our men's soul winning team. And boy, I didn't purposely do it, but the street that we were soul winning on had a great climb. 
a great climb. And uh, oh, I tell you, Brother Mac was out there and just walking up those hills like no man's business. I mean, just conquering those hills like it's nothing. And I thought, wow, I hope that when I get 85 years of age, as he is, that I'm just able to walk. <laughs> Much less walk up a hill. But uh, that would amaze me. You know, and we have dear people in our church that give and, and, and that go forward and try and serve Jesus Christ, and they give it their very best. Well, can I tell you, that's exactly what God wants us to do. And I think as long as we have the gospel as the mainstay of our church in getting out the gospel, it helps us to be able to come together. You know, Proverbs chapter 6, the Bible talks about he that soweth discord among the brethren, and it uses the word uh, abomination there. And you know, you and I are to make sure that we're trying to help and we're trying to encourage. The Bible says in Psalm uh, 133 and verse 1, I read how uh, good and how pleasant it is for, it says, brethren to dwell together in unity. And that's talking about uh, those of us that are saved, boy, how we can come together in church. And, and isn't it good to be able to sing the songs together? Isn't it good to be able to uh, 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 come together and uh, shake the hands during the handshake and Time. Well, I remember years and years ago now, we instituted the handshaking time and uh, where people would walk around and they started shaking hands and, and, and now well, everybody's just, uh, they look forward to that time of shaking hands and talking to somebody, how you doing this week and how you been this week and praying for you this week and excited about what God's doing in your life this week and, and that is an exciting time for us in our church, that time of fellowshipping together. You know, uh, and can I say that uh, churches that uh, have that in front of them, uh, I'm talking about they have things that is put right there in front of them. Can I tell you, they're not easily divided. But I've seen churches where the church programs are dead. Now, I'm telling you the truth. You know, uh, I'm flying out tomorrow morning to preach in New Orleans uh, at, at a pastor's uh, 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 get-together at a local church and, and be preaching for a brother down there on Monday and Tuesday, and then I'll be back here for a Wednesday night Bible study. But can I tell you, uh, uh, I'm excited about those that's in the New Orleans area uh, coming together to hear the preaching of the Word of God. You know why? Because the preaching of the Word of God is that which changes a man's life. And as we come together to be able uh, to be together as a church, united we do stand. But no, oh, if, if it ever happens, oh, if it ever happens when, the, when uh, uh, the house of God divides, can I tell you, there's going to be great destruction thereof. You say, preacher, how can we protect ourselves against that? Always keep Christ first. Always keep Christ first. And it's not that uh, this is what Paul did, and it's not that this is what Apollos did, and it's not that this person has a greater ministry than this person over here. And it's not that this is what Cephas did. No, it always should be about this is what Christ did. This is what Christ did. Christ deserves all the honor. And Christ deserves all the glory. And Christ deserves all the praise in the midst of that which is his local church. Can I say this and I'm done? I'm talking about nations do divide. Uh, churches do divide. Homes do divide. Oh, I've seen homes that separate. Oh, can I tell you that God doesn't want our homes to separate? The Bible says in Mark chapter 3 and verse 25, the Bible says, and if a house is divided against itself, it says that house cannot stand. You know, uh, you think back of different ones. It's even in the Old Testament. You think about Isaac and Rebekah with Jacob and Esau, and there was division over those boys. And what happened after Jacob left, he never saw his mama again. There was division over those boys. You think about Elijah, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Uh, you'll see that uh, Elijah was not sent here to call down fire from heaven. He wasn't sent here to be able to do great miracles. Elijah wasn't sent here to raise the dead. Elijah wasn't sent here to be able to combat and to be able to, to defeat the very presence of Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, Elijah was not sent to be able to pray uh, for, a, uh, if you will please, and drought come for three and a half years. And that wasn't his purpose. Elijah wasn't sent to be able to be uh, fed miraculously by the ravens. That was not the purpose. No, he gives his purpose. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, the Bible says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, says the prophet, it says, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. 
In verse 6, the Bible says, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers, it says, to their children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And so Elijah came to preach that which is the Bible so that hearts would be turned. You know, the other night I preached on, uh, on, on praying. And, uh, and about, uh, uh, you know, maybe God lays somebody on your heart. And I gave a description about how God possibly could lay somebody on your heart. And, and I said, as God lays somebody on your heart, as I passed out those three by five cards, I said, I just want you to write their name down. Don't write nothing down about them. Just write their name down. Because, you see, I think that as we pray for each other, I think that God works in a wonderful way. And, uh, you know, I said, just write their name down. And, uh, and then I said, now, and we talked about offenses, how uh, uh, maybe somebody has offended you, and, and uh, write their name down. And you don't have to say nothing about it, and just write their name down. And then uh, I said, why don't you bring that to the uh, altar? And boy, the scores of people came, and they had uh, uh, different names written down, and they prayed. And by the way, that's the way it ought to be in the home also. When Mrs. Wells, Sylvia and I were married many years ago, uh, we uh, had uh, went through counseling time, and the, the pastor that counseled us said, now, there's one verse I want you to remember, one verse. If you remember nothing else out of this counseling time, one verse, one verse. He said, remember this one verse. He said, let not uh, uh, the sun go down on your wrath. He said, never go to bed mad at each other. Never, never, never. Right. Always resolve your problems. Always take care of your problems. Always talk it out, but never go to bed mad at each other. You know, that's been a principle that Sylvie and I have had over these past 33 years of marriage. You know, where we have never one time entered into uh, the chambers of our bedroom and, and went to bed uh, with each other, mad or upset with each other. Well, can I tell you, listen, uh, we ought to make sure that we work on having good families. Work on it. Work on it. Spend time with your children. Work. Don't let your kids grow up without a daddy. Don't let your kids grow up without a mama. Don't be so busy in your day-to-day -day affairs, no matter what they are, that one day your child grows old and they say, well, I just don't remember dad. Dad never took time with me. I don't remember mom. Mom never took time. With me Now, if you're a child here today and you've got a mom and daddy that loves you so much, they try to spend some time with you, can I tell you, you ought to thank the Lord for that. You ought to thank the Lord because why? Oh, maybe they uh, can't because of their schedule uh, spend an awful lot amount of time with you, but they do clothe you. They feed you. They take care of you. You know, most of the men that's uh, in our church, they, they work hard. Uh, I would dare say that the average man that's in her church is getting up between 4.30 and 5 o'clock every morning and heading out to work. They're pulling long shifts. And they're getting off at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and then uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Dallas Metro or not, but we have a little bit of traffic. <laughs> and something might only be uh, two miles away, but it might take you 20 minutes to drive that two miles. Oh, you say, but preacher, uh, that's just disturbing. No, that's prayer time. That's thinking time. Amen. Uh, you know, it, it's wonderful if you learn to be able to allow God to use whatever comes your way into your life to be able to sharpen you rather than disturb you. You know, and the Bible speaks here about Elijah. What, what did he come to do? Well, the Bible says that he came, and he came to turn the father's heart to the children, to the children's heart to the father's. Now, by the way, uh, you and I ought to spend time. Uh, uh, oh, I remember the vacation days that we would take as a family, and, and uh, I was in evangelism for 12 years, and, I, and we traveled the nation, and I would preach in independent Baptist church after independent Baptist church, and we traveled in an, uh, 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 just uh, one of these SUVs, and that's how we lived, and we would stay in uh, uh, a different uh, hotel room every single night for 12 years, and, and uh, boy, the schedule was booked. And I remember different preachers calling me up. And my family can attest to this. And they said, would you come and preach in the meeting? And I said, if I can bring my family, I'll come. But if I have to fly, I'm not going to come. 
I leave my family behind because I believe my children need a father. I believe that my children need a mother. And I believe they need to see us together. Oh, I turned down, Brother Bachman, I turned down meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. You say, don't you regret that because you've not become uh, necessarily nationally known? No, no, I'd rather my kids grow up and have a, a desire to serve Jesus Christ. I, I, can I tell you this? Can I say that uh, it is so very, very important that you do not forget your home. Don't forget your home. We have people that are married, and, and can I tell you, and I know it's true, but we have people that are married, and it's like a, there's a president, and then the wife is the secretary, and there's no relationship. I think relationships ought to be sweet. Amen. By the way, you listen to me. Uh, those of you that have this, uh, this divider in your vehicles, where the seat is over here, and you got a divider, and then there's a seat over here, you know what that divider's called? It's called a hand holder. I double dog dare you. Those of you that have that divider between your seats, you as a wife, you say, he's not held by a hand in many years. Put your hand on that divider and then say these sweet words to your husband. Honey, I'm putting my hand there for you. He'll wreck the vehicle. Give him a tender push. You know, not every guy has a brain that's still in full operation. <laughs> Give him a tender push. Maybe you want to do that with your wife if you're good at driving with your left hand. Maybe you want to put your hand there and say, Honey, that masculine, intelligent-looking hand is there for you. And before we wreck... Would you please hold it? You know, you might have to give. Uh, I, I had a preacher friend of mine. He said, man, my wife got mad at me. And he said, most of the time, he said, when we'd have our fights, it'd be when we'd travel off somewhere. And I'd be in my pickup truck. And he said, you know, he said, we just begin to fight and squirrel. And he said, just it wasn't good. He said, my wife, whenever she got mad at me, she'd always move away. Stare out the window. He said, that was back in the day when seat belts was not a law. He said, so I knew every time, it just seemed like every time we got in the truck, we begin to drive off and we get into it every single, something about that truck. We get into it every single time. He said, so one night I got the idea. I greased her part of the seat down. He said, nothing that, you know, wouldn't mess up her skirt or nothing. He said, but I, I greased it down a little bit, you know, and made it so something would slide across it. He said, I knew it for sure. I knew it for sure. I mean, we've set a routine. Every time we get in the truck and we get about 10 miles out, we begin to argue about something. He said, I wasn't going to put up with it no more. I found the most squiggliest road I could find. He said, the curviest road I could find. That night I had made my mind up. I wasn't going to let nothing come between my wife and I. He said, and all of a sudden we begin to squirrel. We begin to uh, cut each other down. He said, man, I took that truck around a corner and I took it with great speed. Poof. He said, what I did, my little bitty wife just slid right across, right into my arms. And he said, I looked at hers, I pulled it to a stop and said, honey, isn't this better? He said, I begin to give her sugar. He said, for you know it, we stopped squalling, uh, squirreling, squalling. <laughs> That's what happens when you give your wife sugar, you start to cry. And, uh, but uh, he said, sure enough, he said, we stopped. He said, and uh, after a while, he said, that, that vehicle that we always got in fights in became known as our dating vehicle. Well, isn't that good? Well, you know, it's not good to you because you hadn't tried it, Amen. It's funny, I was preaching for your daddy. I remember this. For your daddy. I was preaching a, a couples retreat in Roanoke, Indiana, many years ago, where Dr. Bachman was the youth director there working for his dad. And I remember preaching uh, there. My wife and I was invited to do a couples uh, a type of retreat deal right there at the church and, or a couples type of uh, conference right there at the church. And, and, uh, and man, you know, uh, it came time to leave and, and uh, I had all the stuff packed in and I told the fellas, I did. I told the fellas, I said, look, on the 
way home. Pretend you're going to run out of gas. Just pretend. I said, you know, just, and just pretend it won't start. Pull over to the side of the road and give your wife some extra special time. And I thought it was good advice. I, I, I thought it was good advice. And so here, I got, done, I got done preaching that night. We're heading out, getting ready to head to the hotel. And, and uh, next morning, we we're going to get up and go to another meeting. And sure enough, sure enough, oh, only about five miles from the church. And uh, Dr. Bachman, his dad, James Bachman, was pulled over to the side of the road. The car was stopped. And I thought, oh, my. They broke down. So I pulled up behind them. And uh, I got out of the car. I went up. He didn't roll down the window or nothing. I thought, oh, man, I hope they're okay. I knocked on the window. All of a sudden, that window started to come down real slow. He looked at me, and he said, what do you want? I said, I thought you broke down. I came to see if you were okay. He said, I was taking your advice. Have a good night. Then the window went back up. Now, look, can I tell you this? If you want a good home, you have to work on it. That's why we have couples retreats. You know, I think, the, what, what was it, year before last, we took our couples and we went to Mexico and uh, took a cruise together. And we flew in Mike Ray and his wife, Verna, and they taught on the couples retreat. Man. Hey, that was good for us. Man. Last year, we had the largest number of couples that came on our couples retreat in the history of hosting couples retreats. And what did we do? We did that to help uh, couples to make sure that their family, make sure that their relationship. I, I'm so excited. We have so many uh, young people getting engaged now. I've done 26 weddings since I've, be, uh, since I've been pastor here. 26 weddings. That's a lot of weddings, you know. But, man, uh, people are getting engaged all the time. I mean, all the time. You know, wow, you know, and we announce this, we announce this, we announce Hey, that is great. That's wonderful. Now, can I tell you this? I'm saying that we ought to work on not having our families divided. Uh, let me say this. It does take work. And you have to decide to do it. You can hear a message like this, and you can just decide. Well, I tell you what, I just don't think I'll do it. If anything is going to work, you have to work on it. You have to work on it. You know, it's amazing as you use Christian terminology and statements, uh, how that uh, uh, in, in, in our present society, it seems like there, that there is a turning back to God and how people identify with that. I mean, that's, that's really amazing to me that what is taking place in, in our nation, how people are giving more attention to God, and, and even now, and working with our mayor, and working with uh, District 5, uh, with uh, uh, getting the Bible back into the public schools of Mesquite, how exciting that is, and what God is doing, you know, in, in our own district with 35,000 public school kids that are now going to be able to have the Bible in their literature program, and stuff like that. I'm so excited about what God is doing. Is It seems like that, yes, even our state is bringing the Bible, just like Kentucky uh, passed that bill, and they brought the Bible back into the public school. So is the state of uh, Texas now, and bringing the Bible back into the public school. And what a wonderful time in which we live to be able to see God do some marvelous things. But all we have to do is uh, just remember that uh, united we stand, divided we fall as a country, uh, if you will please, as a church, and as that which is a family. Let's stay united around the principles of the Word of God because God is always right and God will always help us to do right if we trust Him. Now, Father, bless I do pray.